tawag dito ay Bell Shock Shocks was the first helicopter to enter service with them. medical evacuation. chose 1942 because this was around the peak of Wigram itself and what it was doing. Uh, we had them in operation up until 1977. So uh, I, again I joined in January of 77. These retired in December of 77. So it, one of the first aircraft I flew on in the Air Force was the Hercules. Now the Hercules squadron, number 40 squadron and number 41 squadron which flew Bristol freighters were in the same building. So, like every occupation, there's a lot of rivalry. <laughs> it's like 40 Squadron used to talk about the Bristol Freighter as 30,000 rivets flying in loose formation. We had other names for it as well, but we can't talk about those here. Um, so the Bristol Freighter was designed at the end of World War II. It was designed to replace the DC-3 with the Dakota C-47. And so it was designed as a freight aircraft, which is what the code said. This is a B-120. Now, in, in the military and the US Air Force, they knew about B-17s, B-29s, B-52s, but what's a B-120? So they're expecting this big thing to come in. And he also said, uh, two burning, none... Sorry. <laughs> How many people would you take into the aircraft? So we're breaking into two groups. So uh, ideally six or seven in each group. So uh, I'm not sure which is the easiest way to we manage it. Okay. We had a fight. Okay. So if you come in the second group, and yeah. sure. so the joys of being on aeroplanes, a little bit of an occupational safety and health thing that they now insist that we do. One of the parts of it is we go onto the aircraft and climbing up the ramp, going in through the door. Be careful. The door is very small. So make sure you don't bang your head because you might be too tall. <laughs> yeah, are you, are you saying Dad might be too tall? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I think he might cope. <laughs> oh, good. So one of the parts is the aircraft does have So we pass the camera on the Wow, look at this. You were really determined to get in here. <laughs> Should we stand? Okay, so this is the uh, carrying passengers. There'd be th up to 30 passengers in the aircraft and one crewman. If we were carrying freight and we're doing air drops, we could have uh, up to three crewmen and, and freight. Because one of the parts is when we're doing freight, often we're doing airdrop, which means we need to position that freight and push it out the door. So we need each man to do that. So, uh, again, being a military aircraft, World War II type vintage, you can see how it's not very insulated. It's going to rattle and vibrate. Uh, a lot of noise from the engines. Again, being a modern aircraft, you can see that the business class lounge 
<laughs> so uh, effectively you've got your toilet, you used to have batteries and other oh. equipment stored in here and we'd often store the uh, crew's belongings at this point here as well as a safe storage area. This wouldn't be a seated area, this would be the only seat in this area. So this is where you manage the freight and so on. Okay. Um, sometimes you may find that the, you'll see the securing points, they change at this point here from what they look like in here. These are the ramps, this is one half of the ramp set. So you'd have two of those. Normally they'd either be stored in the very back of the aircraft or the very front. And you'd then connect those up, load the aircraft. Now that ramp is quite steep. Uh, it was actually quite scary getting the load into the aircraft if you had to drive up these ramps. Now they look quite wide, but the angle actually gets quite scary. Very scary. Now these are the rollers that actually come if you were doing parachute drops of freight. You'd actually put your load on and you roll it out and you you use the extra manpower to push it out as far as possible from the side of the aircraft. And which, don't, which door you guys... It would be going out the back, back door. Back door. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Again, a couple more seats, so that's the extra load for us. Uh, so cool. uh, at the front of the aircraft, you've obviously got the entrance to the cockpit. Now the pilot sits just up here. So normally only flown by one pilot. Um, so <laughs> this aircraft was... In fact, the New Zealand Air Force had 10 aircraft, only three of them had dual flight controls. So, um, and so this one isn't one of those. So typically flies with one pilot, and depending on what's happening in the cargo hold, depends on how many crewmen you would actually have. Um, so, and if you were going for a long flight, so these used, like we operated these up into Vietnam and places like that. So flying out of Singapore up to Vietnam was about a four and a half hour flight for one of these things, which was close to maximum flight time. Okay. So in that case, because you're doing over water, often you had a navigator <coughs> in long range flights, but around New Zealand you wouldn't. Uh, now looking at the cargo hole, like the doors, you see these yellow clips? Yeah. They actually hold the door closed, so it doesn't fly out, come open. Yeah. Uh, when you've uh, taxied in, shut down the engines, you the timing is a little up. So this is my memorial wall. Because this is a bit from... It, it's a, a, a wall that talks about my service career. Oh, nice. Because I think we, I did everything that's on those walls. So that was, that's, oh, that, that was your era. That was my era in the yeah. service, yeah. Rebuilt by a friend. Yep. So uh, that was um, that was restored to flying condition at a Hakia. That was something you know. One of the parts is we're now going officially behind the scenes. So again, uh, from a safety perspective, uh, we just caution you against um, reaching behind the barriers because we don't know what. The yeah. engineers have left for us. So uh, we just walk across the That's a workshop. So we're going through to the workshop. Yep. Oh, nice. So it's an actual workshop. So we're going through the workshop on the other side. So we'll come back. This is part of. Um, what we call the reserve collection. So we've actually got two other hangars that are quite a bit bigger than this. We've got other aircraft in storage. 
But, uh, so these are still walking in the uh, Well, no, these are aircraft that flew on the base. The museum doesn't maintain aircraft in flying configuration. Uh, one of the parts is maintaining aircraft for flight means that there's a lot of expense. And certainly with the older aircraft, a lot of insurance overheads. So we don't want to pay for that insurance. So we want to maintain the aircraft as much as possible in their current state while uh, effectively being very managed. I don't know. I What's mum? <laughs> That's okay, I've got grandchildren. <laughs> so, unlike all the Air Force hangars, this one's nicely um, heated yeah. and it's a nice area to work in. I wish the hangars when I was working on aircraft were like this, but they weren't. So, at the moment, this is a major project for the restoration flight. Uh, so, this is what we call a Vickers Wildebeest. It was designed in the interwar period between World War I and World War II. It's all aluminium aircraft. It was actually a torpedo bomber. It had a crew of three. Um, so uh, effectively it served a number of different tasks. Um, through New Zealand Air Force effectively started buying these in 1932. And we retired them in 1942. Uh, we had about 60 of these at maximum on, on the inventory. We were operating these aircraft when, uh, in Singapore when the Singapore uh, fell during World War II. Um, so the aircraft itself um, was uh, used for many different things in New Zealand. Like we had the Hastings earthquake, and they were used for photo reconnaissance during that earthquake period. A lot of photos of the city of Hastings and Brisbane during that war of the earthquake were taken from these aircraft. Yeah, this aircraft uh, is. A, the aircraft behind it is a Vickers Vincent. It's a sister aircraft. The remains of the original aircraft. Wow. As you can see, they're not really worth recovering or, or doing anything with. So they're really just, where they are useful is it provides us information on how this was made or how this was constructed. So effectively, because we've got no plans, the engineers have to look at this and go, ah, how would you make that? So they take this bracket here and then they get, uh, they get some ideas and they make a flat piece of aluminium. They figure out where to drill the holes, how to fold it, how to heat treat it. So in rebuilding the Vickers Wildebeest, there's only um, two of these under reconstruction. There's none other in the world. Yeah, the Vickers Wildebeest is on here is the most developed uh, wildebeest there is. Uh, and the other one's going to fly once it's ready. No, it will never fly. Uh, the left ear in green, uh, a fuel tank. Uh, now this was a winch. This was used, uh, it was bolted to the aircraft, winched out a target, and it would tow a target. And so you would actually get other pilots with machine guns or air gunners would come along and practice shooting the target so they could learn how to fire guns. Um, and equally because uh, warships also have guns on them and they need to learn how to shoot at aircraft. This aircraft was used to tow a target and you fly alongside a naval ship and the guys on board the ship so will practice targets. shooting at the target. Um, so to play around like, yep. to learn pretty much yeah, how yep. to shoot. So uh, that's uh, part of what we do here. So these uh, saw service throughout World War II. They were used as a submarine hunting aircraft. So we normally carry depth charges. But because it was amphibious, uh, it, was, uh, it was designed to fly and land in the water. So one of the parts is, there are two types of uh, the catamaran. There's this style, which this one was only ever designed to uh, land on water and take off from water. But there, were, uh, there is a catamaran around here that actually has an undercarriage that uh, fastens around this point here. Uh, this one was being modified to that to the original little state that the New Zealand Air Force operated them in. So you'd pull this into shallow water, you'd put your wheels in, you'd then 
which the aircraft out of water to do maintenance. Um, so this aircraft has been loaned to the museum, we've stabilised it, we've gone through and got rid of all corrosion that's in the air. Normally the most junior person on the aircraft was told to go swimming, don't bring the pilot back and you pull him back into here. Now one of the parts is when they were operating off the sea it generally wasn't too bad because you had waves. But if you were landing on a lake or landing in a, like a New Zealand Air Force used to have a base in the Thala Bay in Fiji. When you were landing these in the bay, the water was often quite flat. And so the problems you had is uh, flat water actually creates a massive vacuum and holds the aeroplane in the water. So what they had to do was they try and improve this, they actually put a step in here. So as you get fast enough, this creates a bit of cavitation. Um, but even then, you might not be able to get enough airspeed up to break that vacuum in the water. So sometimes you'd have to do a couple of runs trying to create waves in the water, or you may actually get some people in boats to go out and create. So it's like a brand new way. Eh? And this brand new has never been used. Now, like the parts you can see here, we've got two uh, vampire wings. Vampire is the, is the grey aircraft out just by the side of the Bristol freighter. That's a spare set of wings. Um, we, uh, when we uh, effectively the aircraft were retired, there was a lot of stuff put in storage. So we actually still have a lot of stuff. We're actually donating those to other places or sharing those. This is the uh, wing off the Strike Master, which is this aircraft just through here. But that's aircraft We also do things that aren't aircraft related. So this is what we call the Queen Mary trailer. Now the Queen Mary trailer was designed because World War II was happening over in the United Kingdom. So a lot of aircraft crashed or shot down. And so the Queen Mary trailer was actually used to collect these aircraft that landed in a farmer's paddock. The freight aircraft is based off the Hawker Sidley 748, but it's been modified. It's got an uprated engine and propeller. It's got an undercarriage that's designed to kneel, so it literally bends down at the knees. Wow. So as you can see, the, the front of the aircraft is higher than the back of the aircraft, so this aircraft is actually in the melt state now. And now we had to do that to get it into the building. So if you have a look at the top of the, the tail and the height of the doors, yeah. we actually had to lift the tyres down mm. um, and lift the nose up to get the aircraft yeah, into this hangar. On his knees. Yep. <laughs> yeah, a lot of, a lot of equipment um, is used for training aids around the Air Force. So a lot of this equipment through here is training aids that were used at different stages for training either ground crew or air crew. Um, now, we're talking about things being linked. This is a V1 bomb. So this is a, a, the flying bomb that the Germans used in the early parts of World War II for attacking the United Kingdom. Flying bomb. But this is a US weapon. So what the United States did is they captured the V1 bomb, they looked at how it was designed, and they built their own. Yeah. Now, if you read this plaque, it says that this bomb is on loan to us from the US government. Wow. So as we talk about yeah, things being loaned between museums, that's some of the things that actually happen. Now on these sites here, like under that plastic cover there, that's the engine from a, a tiger moth. And that's a, a gypsy queen, so a gypsy I keep the core engine of the Hercules or P3 Orion. The difference between the Herc and the P3 Orion would depend on which way this gearbox was. Oh. So this, this engine is a like looks like a it's a jet engine, jet engine, or a jet, jet turbine. Jet turbine. So what it's got is a shaft that comes out the front and drives into a gearbox that gearbox. drives a propeller. Now, when you fly on a modern aircraft like an Airbus or a, a Boeing, aircraft, Boeing aircraft, they work off a very similar process where they've got the big turbine that is now and captured, it's like a big propeller at the front. But it actually is, instead of having a, a, a gear like this, mm -hmm. this actually is connected to the turbine section and the big blades that you look at when you look at the front of the yeah, engine. Yeah. But this, this is a very scary ride. Yeah, it's very scary. It's a, yeah. So typically if the pilot was in, in flight, he'd try and eject using the face blind. So this pulls down over your face and protects um, your face and your helmet. If you're at low speed or you couldn't reach this, you've got the second ejection leap. Now this would eject you, it has about 13G of acceleration. 
Normally that means that you're being between half and three quarters of an inch shorter after the ejection because it compresses your spine. So normally a pilot after an eject, even today with the new technology, pilots are recovered and sent to hospital to check their spine. They're normally uh, x-rayed to check for any damage to their spinal column, whether you can put them back in the aeroplane or another aeroplane. Sometimes they can have spine injuries after this ejection. Yeah. Correct, yep. So, aft and oxygen. So, this here, effectively you're an eject out, so you punch. Normally, it's quite common that the pilots would black out, almost black out oh, as they exactly eject. And the, you get to around 270 feet, 200 feet, and then this seat would fall away. And so you've now got your dinghy pack underneath you. Uh, you want to actually drop the dinghy pack, so you're going to actually have to remember to uh, release this part, because the last part here, this is about this thick. When you land, you normally land and roll. If you've got, if you've got the dinghy pack still attached to you, it's you're going to break your legs. And break your legs and hips and so stuff. one of the parts, you've got to remember yeah. to get rid of that. But it was still carry passengers. Weird engine, this is off a, um, Airship. Now, when I joined the Air Force, we were just retiring the Harvards, which are the yellow um, basic flight trainer. It was replaced by the Air Trainer, which is actually an aircraft that was built in New Zealand. So it was built out of it um, by a company made of Hamilton. Yep. So it was built in Hamilton. So two people. Yep. Well, it was actually designed to carry three. Yeah. So you had, but. The way it was configured, because of all the electronics that we put in the aircraft, it could only carry two. So we had a, a big six-cylinder engine. Uh, again, we ran these aircraft for a number of years, and then it was retired and replaced it with a CT4E, which had a slightly bigger engine, and a three-bayed prop. So this is the cockpit out of a Skyhawk. So this is what I worked on for 10 years. Oh, wow. yeah. Skyhawk. Uh, Jet fighter. Jet fighter. fighter. Uh, you've seen the movie Top Gun, the oh, first Top Gun movie. movie. This one was that? Oh, really? That's oh, yeah, Skyhawk, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so the A4, uh, again, this was, I had lots of fun in this aeroplane. But the, the hard part is when I sit in the ejection seat, yeah. and then because it's got a head up display, because yeah. we put an F 16 electronics kit into the aircraft, for me to use the head up display and close the canopy, my shoulders were touching the side of this canopy. Mm. So it's a very cozy. You have to lose kind of maybe fat or shoulder fat and. Yeah. Well, no, it's just for me it is what it is. But um, for the pilots, there was actually important. So they had to know on a pilot how long you were from your your shoulders to your hips, from your hips to your knees, and from your knees to your ankle, no because matter. there was a maximum length. Because this head-up display pokes out. Oh really? And if you had to eject, your knees had to be short enough. To get around the head up display. Yeah. Is that true? Like for the to become a pilot, uh, the height of your leg should be shorter as compared to your other bit. Of oh, I'm not. Yeah, well, it's an What's important dimension. Dimension. So, uh, for this aircraft, it was exceedingly important the hip to knee length. Uh, most aircraft have maximum lengths, uh, so you can be too tall to be a fighter to pilot. To be fighter pilot. Yeah. Um, and so in those cases, you just don't get to go for a strike. But uh, you, you, if you're too tall, you end up in transport units or maritime. <laughs> now, but the new New Zealand Navy still operates the <coughs> six flight aircraft. So it's just a later variant of this aircraft with uh, later electronics, later engines, airframe. But uh, still an active <coughs> aircraft and... A format is the same, right? Formats almost identical. Just better engines, better avionics, um, a little bit more capable because the engine's a fraction bigger. Yeah. But um, still operating. Now, in the Navy, uh, the pilot, all the crew, the flight crew on this aircraft are Navy personnel. All the maintenance is carried out by Air Force personnel. So in New Zealand, all the Air Force aircraft are maintained by Air Force personnel. Any have a pilot eject out of one of these that died because he ejected too late Aye. and the aeroplane rolled and hit the trees and he ejected through the trees. So ejection seat doesn't mean you're going to get out safely. Um, and we have seen it on the guy yep. died. Again, it's part of the fun and enjoyment of life. It's like in a car race you can crash and kill yourself.
Yeah, it's all about adventure. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll give you your land guards. Yeah, sorry. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. I appreciate it, Alex. Thank you so much. Thank appreciate you. it. I appreciate it. No, I appreciate it. I appreciate your time as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. Enjoy the trip. Yeah. Thank you. Enjoy the Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Bye now. So, we're going to the tournament. So, we're going to the na para sa mga pinitit ng mga ibig mga klasing aircraft helicopter so yan